President Henberg, uh, members of the Board of Trustees, faculty and staff of the College of Idaho, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, let me start by extending my warmest congratulations to the members of the class of 2010 on your remarkable achievement. I also want to take the opportunity to congratulate all the mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, cousins, friends, teachers, anyone and everyone who contributed in some way to your success. I am truly delighted and honored to be here to take part in this special occasion. And I'm especially grateful to President Hemberg, to Professor Rob Daly, to Ali Rabi, student body president, for extending the invitation to speak to you today. The last time I was invited to the College of Idaho to receive a degree it cost me four years and cost my parents a good chunk of their savings. <laughs> Apparently my time is worth considerably more now. All I've been asked to contribute is this speech and, well, of course, 30 years of diplomatic service to the United States as a foreign service officer. In truth, I am deeply humbled by the fact that the college has chosen to honor me with this recognition. As an ambassador, I'm routinely asked to speak in public, but usually I'm expected to talk about some aspect of U.S. foreign relations or to give an analysis of what's going on in some country or some region of the world and what, all, what it all means for the U.S. So I've never before had the enormous challenge of speaking to a graduating class of a U.S. college or even a high school. So the first thing I did is I asked my daughter who was a junior at Gettysburg College, a small liberal arts college in Pennsylvania, for some advice. And here's what she said. She said, treat it like a conversation. Tell them how it was possible for a kid from a small town in Oregon who went to a small college in a state with a small population to end up as an ambassador to a small country in Asia. <laughs> well, I thought about that for a while, and. I realized that there was more to her advice, more wisdom than I originally thought. First, the size of your hometown or the size of your college in no way limits what you can do in your life. In fact, I am convinced that when it comes to education, small is better. And I know this is very definitely the case of the C of I. The C of I has long nurtured its reputation as a premier institution of higher learning in the Pacific Northwest. And among the reasons the C of I has achieved this standing is the quality of its faculty. When I attended the college, all of the professors were pretty much experts in their field. But more important, almost all were also mentors, always ready to provide encouragement and direction to students who came to them for support. One who I would like to single out today is Professor Orville Cope, who taught political science to generations of coyotes. He was one of those professors who defined their own success by the success of their students. He and other professors like him gave me the confidence and the support that I needed to reach high. Second, the way she phrased her advice made me recall a very important truth. That one's title, even a title like Ambassador of the United States, says very little about how well one's life has been led. No matter how much you've done or how successful you've been, there's always more you can do. There's always more to learn and always more to achieve. And I owe the College of Idaho a great debt for instilling in me a lifelong curiosity about how the world works, a lifelong interest in learning, and in expanding my horizons. Third, she made an important point about the world we live in today, a globalized world, a world in which we are more interconnected than at any other time in our history. A world in which it's really not that unusual for a person to find that life's journey takes him or her far beyond his own hometown or even homeland. When I graduated, the world seemed to be full of challenges. For Americans, Vietnam was a war, not a country. The Cold War was being fought in battlefields around the world, and the U.S. and the Soviet Union seemed to coexist 
only because of the fearful doctrine of mutually assured destruction. Miscalculation leading to nuclear war seemed like a very real possibility. Americans were lining up at the pump to buy gas, suddenly in short supply because of the conflict in the Middle East. The economy was stagnant, jobs were few. Does this any, any of this sound familiar to you? But on the positive side, the environmental movement was starting to take root. Information technology was entering its first phase of innovation. And the idea that the world was interconnected and that what happened in the poor countries made a difference in the United States was gaining ground. We were starting to become aware that resources were finite and that there were limits to growth. Unfortunately, too few of those challenges that we faced then have been resolved. Many have only become more complex and more acute. A couple of years ago, the columnist Russell Baker gave the commencement address at Connecticut College and said to the graduates, I quote, said, so the best advice I can give anybody about going out in the world is this, don't do it. I've been out there, it's a mess. But of course, very few people have the option of following that advice, and I would expect that even among those who could, very few would want to. Every generation has no choice but to take on their share of the burden of trying to make our nation and our world safer and more prosperous, not just for themselves, but for their children and for their grandchildren. In his commencement address at the American University in Washington, D.C., President Kennedy made very clear the link between what Americans do at home and how that impacts what happens overseas. President Kennedy said, the quality and the spirit of our own society must justify and support our efforts abroad. And to this end, I'm sure everyone here recalls that President Kennedy created the Peace Corps for volunteers to serve abroad. And most people also know that the first goal of the Peace Corps was to provide technical assistance to people of interested countries. But fewer people recall that the other formal Peace Corps goal is to, is to promote better mutual understanding between Americans and other peoples. I chose to join the Peace Corps, and I hope that some of you may be thinking about that option as well. I'd like to share with you a little bit about how the Peace Corps experience has shaped my life and taught me some lessons that may be relevant to others. As a volunteer, I was assigned to a small village in a country in West Africa. It was two days' drive away from the capital city, 12 miles by dirt track to the nearest town with electricity and running water. Everyone in the village was a farmer. The women grew rice, the men grew cash crops. Hardly anyone could read or write. My job was to organize the villagers to uh, begin community-based development projects. But when I arrived, I had no good idea as to exactly what kind of project I should be working on. So once I learned the basics of the language, I started asking people what they wanted to do. So I went to the elders, all men, and they said they wanted to build a mosque because doing so, they believed, would help them get to heaven. Their lives were nearing an end, and they were thinking about what comes next. The young men, who still saw an indefinite future ahead of them, suggested planting fruit trees. In a few years, they said, they'd be married, and their wives could go to the market and sell the fruit. And all this sounded pretty reasonable to me, but I thought it would be a good idea to ask the women. And they said that what they wanted the most was for their babies to be healthy, for fewer to die in infancy. Well, for the young men and women, the common thread was lack of access to running water, for irrigation, or for drinking. So I became a well digger. Or more accurately, I wrote up a project proposal to get funds from the US Embassy to buy the cement and the rebar. And the villagers did all the incredibly difficult work of digging by hand through 60 feet of laterite rock to reach clean water. So what's the point? Well, the first one is a lesson that stayed with me all my life. Listening is important. And listening is not easy. 
You have to learn to listen. Really listening requires understanding the words, but also understanding the context. It requires understanding the perspective of the person you're talking to and the way a person's culture, beliefs, and environment shave, have shaped his or her thinking. And this is true for individuals, as true for individuals as it is for organizations or even for countries. The other lesson is that whether you are in an African village or in a city in the United States, there is always something that needs to be done. And there are always people who, if given the opportunity and given the catalyst, are ready to work together to make things better. And I would urge all of you graduates to think carefully about what needs to be done and consider how you might be able to contribute. And then join the millions of caring people who are working individually, in groups or in organizations, to redress wrongs in society, to advance human rights, protect the environment, fight hunger and poverty and disease, or simply bring people together in your communities. I also believe it is critically important for Americans to recognize that we are compelled, if we're going to make our country a better place for our children, to work hand in hand with the rest of the world. One way in which today's world differs from the world of 30 years ago is that new centers of economic power have emerged. A few decades, the U.S. and Europe were in the driver's seat. Then a few newcomers appeared, mostly small countries in Latin America and Asia. But now we are learning how to adapt to the rapid economic rise of the world's two most populous nations, China and India. The rate of economic growth in those countries is amazing. And so too is the impact of their growth on the demand for natural resources and on the global environment. Together with China and India, Brazil and Russia are emerging as economic powerhouses. And taken together, these countries represent two-thirds of the world's population. And economists project that these countries will account for 40% of the growth in the world economy in the coming decade. Only a few years ago, decisions related to the world economy were taken largely by the G8, the group of most developed countries from North America, Europe, and Japan. But when world leaders gathered in the aftermath of the recent financial crisis, they did not represent the G8. Instead, it was the G20 that met to decide on the policies that would set the stage for our recovery. Globalization has become the driving force of our societies and of our institutions and of how nations of the world interact. There is good news, though. The good news is that increasing prosperity around the world is also leading to better educational opportunities for hundreds of millions of more people. And the consequence of having hundreds of thousands more scientists, engineers, and entrepreneurs in this interconnected world is more innovation, more green technologies, and more startup businesses. Globalization and internationalization have become trendy terms at U.S. colleges and universities. More and more schools have recognized the importance, even the necessity, of preparing their graduates to be globally competent and globally competitive. Even fields like engineering and architecture that had shown little interest before have started to make an international experience a high priority for their students. Foreign students also facilitate the internationalization process by bringing their cultural, language, and technical skills to campus. And I congratulate the College of Idaho for having understood the importance of an international orientation long before globalization was even a concept. The college's outstanding international program was one reason I decided to come to the College of Idaho. And I'm delighted that the program continues to be a visible and successful part of a C of I education. Before becoming the ambassador to Laos, the State Department assigned me to be the senior foreign policy advisor at the U.S. Pacific Command, or PACOM as it's called. Several of the world's flashpoints are in Asia, the Korean Peninsula, the Taiwan Straits, and the U.S. plays a critical stabilizing role in the Asia Pacific region, and PACOM is charged with maintaining that peace. Trained and ready military forces are an important tool to that end. Like the Peace Corps, however, PACOM recognizes 
that better mutual understanding is an equally important tool for peace. PACOM commander does exactly what his counterparts in the administration do. He travels to as many countries as possible to meet not only with high-ranking military officials, but also with a broad range of opinion leaders and representatives of civil society. Whenever I've traveled, or wherever I've traveled in my career, whether it was with PACOM commander or the Secretary of State or even the President, the message we heard from foreign leaders was pretty much always the same. Their country, they said, more than anything, wanted the next generation to have more opportunities to lead better lives. The difficulty, of course, is how to get people and nations to work together to achieve these ends without resort to conflict. And that is where diplomacy comes in. And I would be very happy if at least one of you graduates were to decide to pursue a diplomatic career. As a foreign service officer, you'll have the chance to play a part in events that most people see play out only on their television screens. You'll help Americans in distress in foreign countries, and you'll help Americans at home by advancing U.S. interests in promoting peace and stability, democracy, open markets, sustainable development, as well as international cooperation to combat transnational threats like terrorism and pandemic disease. Our country needs a diplomatic service that reflects the diversity of the American people. We need more coyote diplomats. <laughs> so, what does this new globalized world mean for you graduates? Well, it means that in your own lives, you'll need to continuously adapt to change. The U.S. economy is facing new competitors with different ways of thinking. But the U.S. still has a significant comparative advantage in ideas and creativity. In all likelihood, you will end up having more than one job. Very possibly, you may also need to change careers. To do that, you'll need to keep gaining new skills, maybe even new degrees. One person who knows a lot more about the challenges and opportunities of the new world than I do is Steve Jobs. And here's a quote from his commencement speech at Stanford that I found compelling. Steve Jobs said, the only way to do great work is to love what you do. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking. Don't settle. If you can follow that advice, I think you'll be more than halfway there. And here's a reminder that I truly believe will help you get the rest of the way to wherever it is that you set yourself as a goal. There's a saying in Lao that goes like this, light a lantern for another and it will brighten your own path. So graduates, I hope that you will make good use of the gifts that you have been given and that you will choose to brighten the lives of others along with your own. Godspeed, congratulations. <laughs>